I'm Pastor Tom, and welcome to the Sunday Sermon. I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter 1, uh, 7 through 11. Would you please stand for the reading of the scripture? And John the one they called the Baptist, was preaching and saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I, and I'm not even fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And it came about in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice from heaven said, you are my beloved and I am so delighted in you. You may be seated. You ever notice how hard it is to accept a compliment from somebody? Right? It's like, Wow, you look really nice today. What, what a lovely suit and tie. And it's like, oh, this old thing, I just threw it on. You may have spent a half hour like trying to match ties to the shirt and the suit. You know, like, can I wear this striped shirt with this herringbone suit? I don't know. Right? But it's tough to do. It's tough to do. And if you do something well, you know, like, like if you cook something and the people are like, uh, oh, this is so delicious. Oh, no, it's, it's just a simple recipe. You know, we just, we, we have that thing. It's just a thing we do. And I don't know what the origin of it is, but I know that, uh, that it, in, in some ways it's a problem because, when some, because then you end up in a competition. You know, like, wow, that was, you sing really beautifully. Oh, oh no, I just, I have, I'm, I'm just, oh, no. You know, and then we do that. And, it's, and then someone says, no, really, you're great. Oh, no, no. And then, no, you're fantastic. And it becomes like a competition. Like, I'm trying, I'm trying to compliment you. Accept that. No, no, I can't do that. So here's a, here's a hint. Just say thank you. <laughs> Regardless of how uncomfortable you are, just go, thank you. Um, I had to learn how to do that because that's sort of, you know, great sermon pastor, and I don't take much. I mean, a sermon to me is like, yeah, I do my homework and I do the sermon thing, and, but I always have to leave room for the Holy Spirit. So I recognize that in the beginning and the end, because when I sit down and look at the scripture, it's always like, okay, Lord, what's, what are we doing here? And then at some point in there, I, I, I find out where we're going. And I, it didn't come from me, for crying out loud, and then I have to preach it. And so I prep the sermon, but at the same time, I, I have to live, leave space because I don't know how the Holy Spirit's going to work. So by the time I'm done, Holy Spirit's everywhere. So when people are like, oh, I really like that sermon. You know, what am I? Well, <laughs> it was just all the Lord. It was all the Lord. Um, <clears throat> So I just learned to say, thank you. That's so kind of you to say. And you may have heard me say that. That's what that is. That's regardless of whether I feel comfortable or uncomfortable, and typically probably more likely uncomfortable with compliments, I have learned that it's a gift. Just accept it and say thank you. And maybe it's a gift you can re-gift later because someone else might need to hear a good word about themselves. And they may react the same way. And, and by the way, there's another side to that. If you say, if you tell someone a compliment, so I, I, I've learned not to get into that argument with them. But if you say, if you give someone a compliment, and they're like, "Oh no, 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 no," you know, like that, that really looks nice, or "What a great hair!" Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I, what I often will just say is this, you know, "Oh, that, no, it's nothing," or "No, I'm not really that good," or whatever they say is, I, I, I'll just say, "Well, I just wanted to know, want you, wanted you to know that I think." You sounded great, and then I walk away, <laughs> right? Because I'm not trying to force it on them, but I'm trying to make it a, it, this is it in the real world. It's not, we're not going to have an argument about whether or not you feel that way, but I want you to know that that's what I feel, that that's what I saw, that's what I recognized. It takes a while to learn some of this stuff, and you have to encounter these things. Um, in the, so... Christian theology has some places in it that over the years have become very problematic. And, and I, 
I, I've witnessed uh, some of how this works. There's, a, there's an idea in Christian theology that we hear a lot that has to do with sin. So the word sin, terrible translation of the actual word in the Bible. There's kind of two words in the Bible, well, maybe three words. Um, there is a term called evil works, okay? So that's kind of the obvious, like doing things that are harmful or hurtful to people. There's a word called trespasses, and that, those are, that describes times we cross lines, you know, violations of, um, of what is required of us um, uh, or things like that. Um, and then, and then the, there's the word sin, the word that gets translated sin. It actually means to fall short. And so it, that's what it means. But shortcomings in English, well, we all have shortcomings. It kind of undersells the message, while the word sin misrepresents it. So the word I tend to use is brokenness, because brokenness um, implies our need to be healed, to be put back together together again. So I find that the most useful translation for the, well, the Greek word is harmatano. Uh, that's the verbal form. Uh, I find that, that brokenness is the most useful form to translate. Theologically, not linguistically, but theologically, it, it conveys, I think, better what the Bible's trying to get at. So it, we acknowledge our brokenness. Because if we don't, I mean, we'll never, we'll never get healed. Right? What's the first step to being healed? Acknowledging that we're sick. You don't go to the doctor if, uh, you know, like, oh, it's not that bad. You know, your things are falling off. It's not that bad. Well, okay, you'll never get better. Uh, it's like, so uh, Sam's friend, right? What's the first thing he has to do? If he wants to recover, to get to that three months, it started with step one. He had to admit he was broken which comes in the form specifically of, of admitting that he's an addict or that he's alcoholic or whatever. I don't know what his addiction is. but And then admitting he needs a power greater than himself to put him back together again because otherwise life is unmanageable. Well, doesn't that sound like what we're saying every single Sunday? Lord, I'm broken. I need your help and your power to, to get through this. So this is a very important theological concept, and, and, and I'm cool with it. The problem is that over time, it, get, it got distorted so that, well, I, so when I was in seminary, we, you had to do, uh, uh, you know, internship-y kinds of things, right? So I, I did, a, a, I don't know, a semester's worth of interning at, um, it was Presbyterian Homes. Have you heard of them? They're a, kind of a big um, elderly uh, and nursing home facility thing. So I was in, it was a beautiful facility. I was there as a kind of chaplain intern, which meant my job was to walk around and visit people. And I kind of had a list, you, you visit these people. And so there was, I don't remember much of it, but I remember one lady. And she was, she was adorable. She was funny. She was kind. She was interesting. You know, sometimes I go to visit people and they're like, oh, no. I'm like, okay, it's that time of day when I have trouble staying awake and you're not helping, right? But, but that was not the case with her. It was always a pleasure to be there with her. And I would talk with her, and we'd visit and chat. And I would, I, sometimes I would, make a, I would compliment her. I would say, oh, wow, you know, you're, you're so delightful, and you're, you're so kind. Or I'll make some kind of positive comment to her. And when I would do that, the interesting thing happened. It was like a physical change in her demeanor. Because she'd be sitting there, and we'd be talking. You know, I would say something positive about her, and suddenly I'd see this. No, I'm just a worthless sinner. There's nothing good in me except Jesus. Right? And, I mean, if she'd have left off the word, two words from that sentence, if she'd left off the word worthless and the word nothing, I'd have been fine with it. And if she had said, I'm a sinner, and, and the what is best in me is Jesus. I'd have been like, amen, sister, <laughs> right? But that's not what she said. I'm a worthless, no good sinner, and there's nothing good in me except Jesus, right? That's what she said. And that is a common theology in Christianity. I find this in all kinds of different places. And it's wrong, okay? I just, it's just not correct. It's not correct theology. So there's a guy named Matthew Fox uh, my favorite kind of theologian, he was excommunicated for heresy. I love heretics. 
You should know this about me. I love heretics and blasphemers because they always have something interesting to say. Now, this guy is not actually a heretic in the truest sense of the word. He's still a very orthodox Christian. He just got booted from the Catholic Church because I think he was a pain in the rear. Uh, and he ended up, he's, I think he became an Episcopal priest or something. But he wrote a book with a lovely title. It's called We, 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 All the Way Home. <laughs> I, I know. I don't, I, 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 I read it. I barely remember it except for the one most important thing, the key to what he was talking about. And he was, in, he was talking about Genesis, the story in Genesis. So if you remember that the book of Genesis has like these two storytelling units that are then kind of woven together. I always picture somebody braiding hair. So you have one line of hair and another and you kind of braid them together and they're different colors so you can actually see the color changes as it goes. So there are these two story traditions that are being woven together to form what we call the book of Genesis. And, the, and one of those story traditions has a creation story that is we think of as the Garden of Eden. And the other one of those traditions has the, a, a creation story, which is the six days of creation. On the first day, God said, right? And it's in that first story. That's chapter one of Genesis. That's the six day creation story. In that story, it talks about God creating and God looking at what was created and saying, hey, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then finally, in the end of the six days, when God has finally created human beings, I will create human beings in my image and in my likeness. And so God created human beings in God's own image and God's own likeness. God created the male and female. God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and take care of it. And then God looked at everything that God had made and behold, it was very good, okay? So what Matthew Fox says, he was talking about a, a concept that um, is very strong in, in the Catholic Church that he was coming out of, that he, that he got kicked out of. It was a concept called um, original sin. But what he said was, before there was original sin, there was original blessing. And I, I was like, oh my goodness, wow, that's brilliant. And if I'm saying I'm a worthless, no good sinner and there's nothing good in me, what I just said is I'm more powerful than the image of God in me. That when God created me, I'm stronger than my creator. I can undo what my creator has done. And that seems to me like if I was going to define something that was heretical, that, would, that sounds like heresy to me. Because it's saying I'm stronger than God, at least in this one respect. Okay, so I need you to understand what's happening in the, in, in the Gospel of Mark. So remember, the Gospel of Mark, first Gospel written, uh, it becomes, Mark doesn't know he's writing a Gospel, by the way, right? He's trying to write stuff down. I mean, I, I think of it this way. First, he's trying to write stuff down so it doesn't get lost because Peter died and Paul died and a bunch of guys are dying. Eyewitnesses are disappearing. So let's get it down on paper right away. But it's better to think about it as, as he's writing it down, he's trying to write a sermon for the churches in Rome uh, during the period of time between the year 65 and 70, when there is persecution against the Christian community as Christian, and also growing persecution against the Jewish community because of stuff that's going on in, Ju in Judea, in Jerusalem. And it's right at about the time when the Jewish war begins, the Jewish war is gonna result in the destruction of the temple. And the, it, this is a very bad time to be a believer in Messiah Jesus, it just is. And so he writes a sermon. The other, the other three gospels all, so Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel use Mark as a template, but they, they talk about what happens before. Like we get a story, we have two stories in Matthew, the birth of Jesus, and then we get a story about the coming of the Magi, and then when they have to run off to Egypt to escape Herod's. Um, trying to kill off the kids. In Luke, we get, a, we get the story of the birth of Jesus. We get a story about when he goes, when he's brought to the temple um, at eight days uh, for an important ritual um, that uh, it's associated near circumcision. It's around that same time. And, and then we also get a story when Jesus is 12 and he's like in confirmation class or preparing for his bar mitzvah or whatever was the equivalent of that back then. And so we have this sense of Jesus around prior to 
uh, the appearance of John the Baptist. And then, of course, in the Gospel of John, John, forget that, John goes all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, he goes right back from before there's time at all. There is the Word. There is, the, we, we, we like to say, the, the, uh, the pre-existent Christ. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's the, and so that's how they all are talking about it. So in, in every single case, the setting, the first sort of thing that happens when Jesus shows up, which is the baptism, is set in a bigger context. But in Mark, it's just out of the blue, right? There's this, there's this message that, hey, Isaiah was talking about this thing, and lo and behold, it's the Baptist. It turns out, fits the bill. You know, one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And the Baptist is like, <laughs> guess what? I get a word too. My word is someone's coming after me who's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And then boom, and then Jesus shows up. But Jesus hasn't done anything yet. As far as the Gospel of Mark is concerned, Jesus hasn't done anything yet. There, there's no talk about the, what happened before. He just, boom, and he came from Galilee. That's literally all the information we have. If all we had was Mark, all we'd know is Jesus came from Galilee. Done. And yet, what's the first words spoken about Jesus? You are my beloved, and I take delight in you. Before Jesus has done anything, at least as far as Mark's gospel is concerned, he's already beloved. He doesn't have to do something in order to be beloved. He doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. He doesn't have to worry about disappointing someone like he doesn't have to try to meet some standard in order to be my beloved it's already there and it's true not only of jesus but of us as well because we live our lives always trying to please people we're always worried someone's gonna be disappointed in us that's actually one of the really powerful ways to control other people's life i'm really disappointed in you i'm not angry i'm just disappointed right <laughs> you've heard that one i'm sure at some point in your life i'm just disappointed so what you're saying is, I am not actually the person that you imagine I ought to be? I think that's about you and not about me. Don't, don't, I'm, I could be wrong about that. But we don't say that. We're just like, oh, I'll try, I'll try harder. I'll try to do better. We spend our lives that way. And the threat is that we're not beloved unless we do all this stuff and live up to everybody's expectations. And in the absence of that, because who can live up to everyone's expectations? We end up where that wonderful, sweet lady was all those years ago. I'm a worthless sinner. There's nothing good in me. Hold a baby in your arms, and you will know, and you will understand. The child hasn't done anything yet, but you will know they are beloved, and you will take delight in them. And the truth is, that's the core, that's the start, that's the changeless reality of who we are in God. Those words that come from the heavens and spoken to Jesus are the same words spoken to us. You are my beloved, and I take delight in you. Can you find the prayer of response printed there in the bulletin? Uh, please stand as we pray together. I look at my life and I see so glaringly my failure, my foolishness, my brokenness. I see my willful impurity, my casual cruelty, my careless selfishness. And soon I believe that these are the things which define me, that these things mean I have no value and no worth. Remind me always that my first truth is this, I am beloved in your eyes and you can take delight in me. So let me be pleasing before you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd love to have you join us for Sunday worship at 8.30 at the Christ United Methodist Church or 10.15 at the Stanton United Methodist Church. Until next time, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the face of the Almighty be upon you. And may God grant you peace. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. Oh, you got to move.